Rather, we're looking at it and saying, why does it say that? And, um, you know, this makes a difference, looking at it that way. This is the first time that I've carefully studied through the book, looking at it from the perspective of why and not uh, what. In other words, instead of looking at it from an intellectual perspective, saying, uh, as we get into ch- uh, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 11 here, it talks about measuring the temple. Instead of looking at that as in uh, what is being excluded from this measurement, uh, what side is it, how big is it, what's the linear feet, instead of looking at it from that perspective, I'm looking at it from the perspective of why does he say that right here? What is the reason behind this and how does that change me today? What can I do? From what I see, and you know that really changes uh, the way that I look through this today. I enjoyed this uh, because of that change. I hope you do too. Let's let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and mercy and goodness, and thank you for the Book of Revelation and for loving us enough to uh, give us this glimpse of what's going to take place, both to comfort us and to correct us. Father, I pray that as we open it tonight, we would be changed by the Word of God and that we would grow. And, uh, and mature in our faith, Father, that we would walk more uprightly and walk closer to you. Father, I pray for the ministries that are taking place tonight around the island. Lord, I pray that your hand would be on them and uh, that your um, love would clearly show as, as uh, the ones around us are being ministered to. Father, I pray for our island um, as we're coming into election that you would appoint the ones that you would have in those seats. Father, that you would stir up your children to vote, Father, across the nation, that you would be with our government, that uh, your will would be done, and that they would have wisdom, and they would allow us to worship and to function in peace and prosperity. Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Revelation and make some notes as we go along. We're going to be in chapter 11, and this is an exciting chapter. This... uh, When I was uh, a boy listening to my dad teach through the book of Revelation, these two witnesses were my two favorite characters. These guys are like superheroes. I mean, real-life superheroes calling stuff down. And uh, I remember clearly sitting in the little town of Hohenwall listening to my dad talk about these two witnesses, and it really captivated my imagination. So I hope you enjoy it tonight. Now, we're going to go back and look a little bit here in chapter 10, just as we're getting ready. It's almost one thought. These are both, both of these chapters, are most of chapter 11, all of chapter 10, takes place between the 6th and the 7th trumpet. So we are, we're, we're, we're finished with the 6th, and then we just take a break, and we look at uh, a couple of different uh, things before we get to the 7th trumpet. So... Uh, Right here, Revelation chapter 10, verse 10, it says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And there was given to me a reed likened to a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. So right here in the beginning, this is almost odd, these first two verses. The rest rest of the thing we're going to look at tonight is all about... The two witnesses. It's about them calling down fire and what's taking place and who they are. And it's that's what it's all about. And it's the entire scope of events that take place in the book of Revelation from the perspective of the two guys in Jerusalem. That's going to we're going to cover the whole thing or the last three and a half years here tonight. So the 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 question I ask myself is, why are we measuring the temple? It doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the chapter as far as I can see. It doesn't describe the temple in the rest of the chapter. It doesn't uh, uh, make a reference to it for any particular reason here. It just says that these two guys, uh, this, this, he gives John this, this read, and he says, measure the temple. 
doesn't even say how big the reed is. He doesn't say how much he's cutting off. He doesn't say how big the temple is. It's an interesting thing that he does here. And the reason is found here in verse 2. He says, but the court, which is without the temple. Now, what does that mean? What is the court without the temple? Now, if you were, if you were uh, versed in the Old Testament, if you understood the Old Testament and, and had read the whole thing the way that the Jews had, the way John and the guys had, you know exactly what he's talking about when he gives you a read and says to measure the temple. He's looked, talking about Ezekiel chapter 41 and 2 and 3, where greatly laboriously, Ezekiel lays out a blueprint with just words. Now, I have in my office a, a um, um, paper where this property was gone over by uh, a, a surveyor, and they explain the property with words, what you go where, and it's incredibly boring. Ezekiel 40, 41, 42 is so similar to that. There is a lot of measurements that if you don't sit down and chart them out, get just mind-numbing. Let's look at three of the verses I pulled at random here. He measured also the porch of the gate with uh, within one reed. Then measured he the porch of the gate eight cubits, and the post thereof two cubits. And the porch of the gate was inward. And the little chambers of the gate eastward were three on this side and three on that side. And they three were one measure, and the post had one measure on this side and on that side. So he's got this little uh, three-meter-long rod, and he's measuring everything out. And he, he tells you how long everything is. It goes on like that for three chapters. Well, when we get to the book of Revelation, he doesn't redo all that. Instead, he says that the... As the temple was measured here, count out the outer court. Now, if you look at this as a, a rendering off of Lagos, the, the Bible program that I have, this is a rendering from them of the little measurements that Ezekiel does there. The walls are dropped down so you can see it. And uh, you can see the four inter, inner uh, little buildings there, the temple and then the three uh, right in front of that. Um, that would be the inner temple, the inner, inner sanctuary. And then the outer court is the big section on the outside. The inner, inner section would look something like that. It would just be this, uh, this uh, small section of temple and the inside court and the altar there. And he says to, to John, I want you to measure it and leave out the outer court. Only focus on that inner section. Now, why would he do that? Why would he tell John this and not give us any measurement? And not say why. Continuing on, Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, he said, But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, one thing that you do when you're surveying is you put a stake in. And you measure everything off of a stake, or three or four, in your whole plot. plot. So you'll take this stake, and you'll see, you'll describe where that stake is. It's this angle off the road. It's at this particular coordinates. And you say, okay, from this stake, you turn that direction and go this far. And without that stake, you can't, you can't tell what direction to go. And you can't tell how far to go. Everything is measured off of this one finite point that allows you a place to measure. The rest of this chapter, this is our stake. It's telling us where and when this is going to take place, what's happening and why it's happening for the rest of the chapter. Look in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. It says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. For, uh, for a background, this is Christ talking about the second coming here in the book of Luke. So Christ is talking to the disciples about uh, the second coming of the Messiah. Okay, continuing on. 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles till the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distresses of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So he gives us a, an accounting of the last 
period of time until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Right here, he doesn't explain what that is, how long it is. But there's coming a point when we put a stake down and we say, okay, from this point till the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled is three and a half years. That's how long it is. In case you didn't get that, it's 42 months. In case you didn't get that, it's 1,260 days. So he's going to describe it with three different measurements, three different times, that this is our point. This is our measurement. From this point on, three and a half years, and we're done with the time of the Gentiles. Continuing on, 2126. Men's heart failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So Jesus says to him back then, there's coming a time when the time of the Gentiles is at an end and the very powers of heaven are going to be shaken. Now what is that? The stars are going to fall. The sun is going to get darkened and hotter. The moon's going to turn red. It's going to get dark part of the time. The, the very fabric of the universe is going to be torn and shaken at this period of time. And, and men's hearts are going to fail for fear. They're going to be destroyed by fear. And he says, when this happens, if you're of the Jewish nation and you're waiting for the redemptive Messiah to come, for the one to come back and set up his theocracy here on earth, he says, look up. The time's getting close. doesn't tell you when, but the time's getting close. It's not just here in Luke. Look in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. And we're going to go through. I could pick out a verse and give you a verse here and there. I could say, here's this verse and tell you, but I don't like doing that because it it makes you trust me for context. And what I like to do is I like to show you what the Scripture says, and I like to get out of the way as much as we can. I like to just be a tour guide through the Bible and say, here's where the Bible says, isn't that cool, isn't that cool, and I want to get out of the way. I don't want to talk about my opinions or my uh, understanding, I want to just point to the site and tell you about what's in the Scripture and let you see it for yourself. So let's go through some of this. Daniel chapter 12, starting in verse 4. It says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So God has just given Daniel a great revelation. And he says to Daniel... Don't tell them what's taking place until the time of the end. There's coming a time when people will run to and fro and knowledge will be increased. Now, have you? there has never been a time in history that that is as true as it is today. It is incredible the way knowledge has been increased. If I ask you how far is the sun from the earth, you might rattle off, oh, 94 million miles. Okay, how far is it to Mars? Do you know that? Well, maybe not, especially this month, because we're in an elliptical orbit. But guess what? You pull out a device, okay, Google, how far is Mars from the Earth today? It will give you to the mile. It'll tell you. So knowledge has been increased, and people are running to and fro. My kids are like 6,000 miles away right now, and my heart hurts because they're way over there, and I hate that. But I'm going to go see them soon. And, man, I'm going to just travel 6,000 miles in a few hours compared to what it took years and years ago. So he says, Daniel, this stuff has been sealed up till the time of the end. People are going to run to and fro, and knowledge is going to be increased. Continuing on, 12.5. Then I, Daniel, looked. And behold, there stood uh, uh, other two, one on this side of the bank of the river and, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And the one said unto the man in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Now, I think these guys on each side of the river are probably Moses and Elijah. But I can't say for sure, so that's my opinion, not what the Scripture says. Continuing on, Daniel 12, 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. 
when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So these two guys on the river, they take over the conversation from Daniel. There's one on each side bearing witness and the one walking on water in the middle. And they say to the one walking on the water, when is this, how long is it going to take? And he says, I am going to promise by the one that lives forever and ever. I'm going to promise by him that it's not going to take more than a time, times, and a half. And if you look up the way that's always been used, one time is one year, times is two years, so that's three and a half, three and a half years. Same measurement. Daniel 12, 9, and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. He says to Daniel, I want you to hide this. I don't want you to tell anybody. Seal it up. A lot of people are going to be purified. They're going to be made white, and there's a lot of people that are going to do wrong. And that's just part of history. It's what's going to come to pass. Continuing on, Daniel 12, 11. And from that time, the, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh death desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So this is a month longer than the other times that we have. But he says, here's our pen, our stake, when the abomination that maketh desolate is set up in the temple. So there's come in a time when the Jews are in the temple, they're offering a sacrifice to God, and something is going to, and we know it's a statue, is going to be set up of the beast, and it's the abomination that maketh desolate, and in the temple, and the Gentiles will trodden underfoot that section of the temple for a thousand and two hundred and ninety days. I think it takes an extra thirty days from when that starts to when the two prophets get here. Could tell you know in Romans chapter eleven verse twenty five, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So he says right here that, that there's coming a time that a deliverer will come out of Zion. That's in uh, Psalms uh, 52, 8. That, that there's a deliverer coming from Zion. It's other places as well. And, and he will come and deliver Israel. And he says that's not going to happen until the time of the Gentiles is finished. Now, when is the time of the Gentiles finished? From the time of the abomination that maketh desolate set up in the temple and these witnesses come down three and a half years later, the time of the Gentiles is over, and the Messiah comes into his kingdom to deliver Israel. So that is our, our, our grade stake that we are going to measure the rest of the time frame hereby. Continuing on, 11, uh, Romans 11:27. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, as concerning the gospel they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So Paul says, listen, don't think that the church is replacing Israel. Don't think that God is done with his people. God made specific promises to his people, and God's promises are without repentance. He's not going to back away from what he said he would do for Israel. And at the time of the Gentiles, when that finishes, then, then Christ is going to come back and bring righteousness back to Israel and set up his theocracy, his kingdom ruled over by God. Now, when did the time of Gentiles start? It started when the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, moved from the the ark of the covenant that God had with the children of Israel, when that was removed and the, the people of God, the bride of Christ, became God's temple, then the time of the Gentiles began. It was our time. It was our time to believe and trust Christ. And this doesn't exclude the Jews. They can believe and trust Christ the same. 
But this specifically is the time for the Gentiles to be gathered together and grafted in. And at that time, when, when Christ comes back and marches back into Jerusalem, the time of the Gentiles is done, and now it's the time for the kingdom of the Jews to be picked back up. Continuing on, Revelation back to Revelation chapter 11, starting in verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. So he says to uh, John that he's going to give power to his two witnesses. Now, I think this is interesting, that what they're doing is prophesying. You see right there in the latter half of the verse, it says that the two witnesses will be prophesying. But he doesn't call them prophets. He calls them witnesses. Now, that's a fascinating little tidbit. Why does he call them witnesses and not prophets? And then here we see that measure of time again that there are 1,203 score days, so, so 1,260 days. Now remember that the, uh, the uh, statue is going to be there 1,290 days. I think that the dispar- disparity there of time is either it's set up before the two witnesses get there, or on the day that it's set up, they show up, and then they're removed, and God starts to come back, and his trip around the globe takes an extra 30 days before he cleanses the temple, because that's where he's ending. But he says that, that uh, these two witnesses, he calls them, will prophesy for a thousand and two score days. Continuing on in chapter 11, verse 4, it says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the, uh, the God of the earth. Again, interesting phrasing. He says that these two witnesses that are prophesying for three and a half years, they are the ones that are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, which are standing before, and he gives the name the God of the earth. Ah, fascinating. Why does he say the God of the earth and not God of heaven? Why not uh, the one that liveth forever and ever, the one that dieth not? The Alpha and the Omega, why specifically the God of the earth? And what's the reference, the two olive trees? Zechariah 4.11. I know you're holding your breath. You didn't think I'd show you. Zechariah 4.11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and on the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which go the go, uh, which through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now look at this. He's called the God of the earth. And back here in Zechariah, he's called the Lord of the whole earth. So it gives us this tie between Revelation and Zechariah. These are the two that stand before the Lord, the the ruler, the creator, the God of the whole earth. And they are anointed. Now, why do they stand there? Because they're witnessing what God does, and they're witnessing what takes place in heaven and on earth, and the righteousness of God as He does it. Look back, all the way back to Revelation 11.3. And he starts to start again, and he says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, standing before the God of earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must be in this manner, in this manner be killed. So he says that these two witnesses that are standing there are God's witnesses. They're the two olive trees that bear witness to what God is doing, the God of the earth, and that when people try to hurt them, these guys are going to belch fire out and consume those people. Now, guys, if, if you are taking this allegorically, I am sorry for you because you are missing out on all kinds of incredible action. These are two witnesses of God 
these, this is Moses and Elijah, I, I think, and I'll show you why I think so in a minute. But these two guys are, are coming down from heaven right after this statue's up in the temple. So imagine the, what we've read so far, the first three and a half years. The, first, the four horsemen have come, and with them comes death. The animals are fighting back. But you can kind of think maybe it's natural, right? The kingdoms of the earth, peace are taken, and they're fighting each other. And people are like, man... First, all these guys get raptured out. These kind of God people are gone, and some airplanes crash, some economies come down, and then everybody gets in a big fight. But maybe that's because of what went on before. And then dogs start biting people, and I'm sure they'll come out. That's this new virus that came out, and the animals got it, and that's why they're chewing off each other's face, and bats are eating you and stuff like that. It's terrible. And, and then all of these other plagues, the Bread gets really expensive. Oil is not touched. Maybe that's, yeah, it kind of follows Revelation, but maybe there's a natural reason. Finally, this guy comes in and goes, peace, peace, let me fix this for you guys. And he, and he stops at all this, and he creates this peace. And the world goes, finally, we have a ruler to kind of pull things together in this one world order. And what a blessing that is, the world says. And, and, and then he goes, you know, let's set up a temple of me. Right here, a statue of me right here in the temple where the Jews have, have built this thing over the last three years while all this stuff's going on. And so they, he sets up this big temple, and then here come these two guys walking into Jerusalem. And they've got sackcloth on, this real rough, hairy garment. It's kind of nasty, and I think they've got big beards because I, I have a cool imagination, and that's the way it is in my imagination, right? Moses and Elijah got these big, cool beards. They're kind of, they walk in and they. They start by, people of the earth, repent, you know. And the people are like, well, these two weirdos, there's a lot of weirdos that come around Israel. And so they kind of get ignored and they go, I said repent, whoom. And they call down a mountain of fire into the ocean, man. And the ocean boils and people die and water turned to blood. And, you know, God's doing it. There's a trumpet being blown in heaven. These guys know what God's going to do. They're planning for it. They're, they're not making it happen. Any more than when you go to an air show and you and you and you see the, the the airman out there and he's like does this and all these these F-18s fly over real fast and real low and you're like man that guy waved his arm and these jets flew over and he didn't make the jets fly over he knew when they were coming so he waved his arms well these prophets know what God's doing but God gives them some autonomy but they've given their will to God and they're being obedient to Him so they're they're making this stuff happen and as they do man, they're calling down fire waters turning to blood trees are all burned up a third of the grass is all burned up these things come out of the ground in the meantime the beast comes over or, one, or some of the armies of the lord come over or, i mean not the lord armies of his that come over and and uh, one of them grabs a 45 you know and he's like how dare you my kids died boom and this guy just opens his mouth boom a big fire eats the guy whoa Whoa, got to be cool on the news, right? There there he is out there reporting, and, and now they're going to shoot him, and boom, they all roast him. They're like, whoa, and it's in the news in the whole world. And so they get a better plan. They get way back with tanks, you know, 17 miles away, and they lob this missile over, and they're, they're recounting, okay, they're getting ready to fire. Here we are, 105 millimeters of bang coming on these. Here comes the missile, and the guys look over open their mouth and fire flies 15 miles and the tanks just melt and people all die and they're all watching on the news. Woo! You think these guys are popular? You think the world likes them? You think that they're well received as they stroke their long beards and they stand there in sackcloth and they call for repentance? So they're enemies. Boy, they've got a lot of enemies. They come out and they try to hurt them and enemies don't die in any other way. You lift your hand against these men of God and their mouths open and fire destroys those men. You know, we get used to the God of forgiveness. Have you ever heard God is love? How could God judge people because God is love? I've heard people tell us that there's no way there's a hell because God is love. Yes, He is. But God is a God of truth and righteousness. And He loves you so much, He wants to redeem you out of your sin and doesn't want to consume you with fire. So He made a way. He gave His only Son to die on the cross so that you wouldn't have to go through this. That's a God of love. But He's also a God of justice and a God of judgment. And He's going to bring the pain and the judgment. 
Look over here in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20. It says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. If these two men stand there, I have no doubt that they're preaching repentance. That Moses himself is preaching repentance to the people of the world. Repent, because God's coming back in, in, in 360 days, now 359, 358. He's calling for repentance, and as they don't repent, he calls fire. He calls brimstone. He calls heat and flame and Horses that spit brimstone out of their mouths and their snakes on their tails are biting men. And boy, do they make some enemies. Continuing on, chapter 11, verse 6. These have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have the power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, we can look at this two ways. Either it's saying that God has given them this authority right here and right now, which I think is probably applicable. But it can also be that these two men have done this in the past, that this is who they are and what they've accomplished. Now, look at these have the power that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Well, that was Elijah. Elijah made the prophecy that it wouldn't rain. It's quoted in James. We'll look at that in a minute. And smite the earth with plagues, turn water into blood. That would be Moses who's done that. It says in Jude chapter um, 9, it says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him railing accusations, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So James is telling us, I mean, sorry, Jude is telling us that that when uh, Moses would died, or when his body was placed in the ground, that the devil wanted that body. And that Michael, the angel, wouldn't let him have it. Michael, the archangel, goes down there and says, No, the Lord rebuked thee. This is ours. Now, I can't think that this is an uncommon occurrence. I don't believe that every time a saint dies that the devil tries to get their meat for some reason, or that... that the angels dispute over that. Uh, have you ever been to a funeral? It would get pretty exciting if Michael and the devil show up and start fighting over the casket. But that doesn't take place on a normal basis. So why with Moses? Look in Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him, so God buried him, in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Porah. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So Moses walks up the mountain completely healthy, clear-eyed, undimmed, strong, and falls over. God buries him. Satan fights over him. Michael doesn't let him have him. And I would contend that Moses is resurrected much the way that Lazarus was resurrected. That God held Moses' body in Stacy's, and that Moses wasn't in Abraham's bosom the way that Abraham and David were. That he and Elijah were both uh, kept physically waiting for their moment of death. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 11, And it came to pass as they went on, this is Moses and Elisha, and talk that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind unto heaven. Now, that would have been exciting and terrifying and something you wouldn't forget. Moses, I mean, uh, Elijah and Elisha are walking along there together, and, and they are uh, just uh, talking and chatting. And here comes this chariot of fire and these horses of fire, and they go right between the two of them. Elijah jumps out of the way. Elisha jumps out of the way. Elijah goes up in a whirlwind. But the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. So Elijah went up apparently without dying. We have one other instance of this. Enoch was translated and did not see death, for God had translated him, for he had this testimony that he pleased God. But this Enoch that went up was translated. I think he was... Uh, 
shifted somehow from a from his physical body and didn't ever see death. He passed out beyond it. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This has not happened yet. Now, um, um, John the Baptist would have been the Elijah, which was for to come, if Christ had been received as the Messiah, but he was not. And this is talking about the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is when Christ comes back the second time in all of his glory and majesty to bring justice and judgment to the earth. So it says here that God would send Elijah first. So that's still coming, still going to happen. Luke chapter 9, verse 29, and as he prayed in the fashion, uh, this is Jesus praying, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glittering. And behold, there were talking, or there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So as Christ is up there praying on the Mount of Transfiguration and and he's got his head bowed. The uh, disciples are looking on there. And suddenly, Jesus is changed from the one that they know to his appearance, the way he's going to look in his resurrected body there. And he's got he's glowing, and he's got on this, this glittery garment. And there's two men there. It says they're men, and they're Moses and Elijah, and it names them. And what are they doing? They're telling Jesus about what's going to happen, what's going to be accomplished. Now, why are they doing that? Because they're God's witnesses. They're the two olive trees that stand on each side of the throne are, are of God's place where he's got them, and they witness what God is doing, and they come down and they bear record for things that are happening on earth from time to time. And here they show up, and they tell uh, Jesus what's going to take place. Now, this is before the resurrection. So Abraham, Isaac, David, all those guys are still in Abraham's bosom. And these two guys show up apparently in the flesh to talk to Christ. So fascinating tidbit. That's some of the reasons, most of the reasons, that I think these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Continuing on Revelation 11:7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them. And kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So here these guys are for three and a half years. They carry on, and they are in the street, and every calamity that takes place on earth, these guys are pointing. They're pointing, and that calamity is taking place. They're talking to somebody that comes up to interview them, talk to them, and they call for repentance. Listen, you folks in India, you need to repent tonight. You need to repent because judgment's coming. And the folks in India are going, no, we don't think so. And they say, you need to repent of your idols and your, and your worship of your false gods. And you need to get that dot off your forehead. And you need to bow your head to the Most High God. And they go, no, we don't believe that. And they say, India, we told you. Whom? And just like that. A big chunk of the nation is just destroyed with fire and with blood. And and the people in India don't repent. They go back and they bow themselves down to their false gods and they hate these two guys. So this has been going on for years now. And the people of the world send ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, all the way over from America. And they try to drop it on these guys to stop this. And just as the missile comes through and it, and it hits terminal velocity, they look up and fire just destroys the missile, comes back over, goes down into that bunker where the missile came from and melts a hole 300 feet deep. And all of them are killed. And they're all dead. And the guy that said push the button, he's dead too. If you bring your hand against these two men, you have to die by fire. It's the way it's going to take place. So after three and a half years, the world is exhausted. They've done everything they can. They have no more tricks up their sleeves. There's nothing they can do to fight these men. They can't sneak up on them. They can't send missiles at them. They can't shoot them. Nothing has worked. They are at the mercy of these little devils that are stinging them. And then here comes the beast out of the pit. And he comes up. And I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know if it's a physical attack 
or if he roars and these two men fall down dead and their dead bodies lie in the street of that great city for three and a half days. Can you imagine the world as the beast comes out and he does this thing and these two guys die and, and they're watching it there on CNN and, and there's uh, Allison uh, Copper over there and, and, and she's like, oh my goodness, they're dead. Are they really dead? And, and they're all like, oh yeah, you know, and, and, they're, and then they start... It's over, friends. It's over, over. The the tribulation's done. We've won. And who's done it? And they and the camera goes to the beast, and everybody starts rejoicing. Woo! It's a party for three and a half days, and the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies for three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell in the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So here they are. After three and a half years, these guys die. And oh, they're excited. Oh, wall-to-wall coverage, 24-hour news. Can you believe it? It's over. We've won. The beast delivered us. Everybody's rejoicing at this point. He's come out of the pit and he's delivered them. And they say, what should we do with their bodies? They want to leave them in the street. Film crews are coming by. They're filming them up close. And, man, after after all the plagues and all the pain, and they're interviewing everybody, and, and here they are, and there's the, the big interview going on. They've got all their newsstands set up. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. But you can imagine. It says that in three and a half days, everybody in the world sees it, right? So there's still satellite news. No other time in history could this have been possible than in the last 50 or 60 years that this would be possible, that everybody in the world would be able to see one event in the space of three and a half days. So this is this is this goes on to all the world in one time, and they're all giving gifts, and they're sending food back and forth. They're coming out of their bunkers, and there's the, the media, and they're down there, and they're like, so, George, what 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 is the mood like on the street? And he's like, oh, there's a celebration, and everybody's so happy, and world peace. It's finally going to come about because of the death of these two just awful people who were calling down all this destruction. And, and how long has it been? Well, it's been three, nearly three and a half days. And, man, they're, they're getting kind of gross. And, and, you know, but we just don't want to move the bodies. We're all so exciting. Oh, no, after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood on their feet. And a great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. As this takes place, all the enemies on the earth are glued to the television. They're all watching as they're rejoicing, and they're giving gifts, and they're commenting on, These guys are starting to seek, and they stand up. And a great voice from heaven. Boys, come on home. I'm coming back. And they get... Raptured. I think this is when the rest of the New Testament or the uh, tribulation saints are raptured at the same time. This is the end of the of the first resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and and they come back and they ascend and they go up to be with Jesus, and then they're going to come back in just a little while, and they're going to see as Christ takes possession of His planet. Continuing on Revelation eleven thirteen in the same hour. There was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. So here they've been watching these guys, and as they are lifted up on their feet, the earthquake happens, which is our marker in the book of Revelation of the second coming, the second advent when Jesus comes back, this, this earthquake takes place. And they gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, when you give glory, it's not just about singing and clapping your hands and saying, Hosanna to the highest. It's about recognizing this man is the God of heaven and earth, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, that no one can stand up to him. No one can gainsay what he says. There is no greater power on heaven and earth or under heaven and earth given whereby men might be saved 
then God and Jesus and God Almighty, and He is the one and the only, and you better listen to this man. And they, they, as they understand that, they give glory to Him. They recognize Him and who He is. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Death doesn't get you out of that. It doesn't matter if you die and an atheist and you hate God and God is a so-and-so and how could He, how dare He tell you what to do and you are are going to have it your way and play that song at your funeral and, and there's coming a day when you will bow your knees before Jesus Christ and you will confess that He is God Almighty, that He's your God and that there is no other. And so... At this, at this time, an hour after these guys are raptured out, they go back up to heaven, they're caught up, there's a great earthquake and a tent of the, that city is destroyed. Now, Revelation has four references, four particular uh, second comings that we see. And it's all the same event. And I, I thought I would have time to do this more in detail tonight, but I'll run through them real quick just so that we can see these four separate events. So this is the first one. And the heaven departed. This is Revelation 6.14. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every island were moved out of their places. So this was John as he's looking from above and he's seeing the, the seals as they're opened. And under the sixth seal, when uh, the Messiah comes back, the islands are moved out of their places. There's a lot more about this in the Old Testament. And that creates a great earthquake because the earth is literally shifting to make a highway for the king to ride across it. The second time is the one we just read, Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. And it says the same hour there was a great earthquake. That's the same event that was taking place right there in 614. The third time that we see this take place is in 1618, and we'll get to that uh, in a month or so. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. So this is talking about, and if you read the before and after, this is talking about the second coming of Christ as he's coming back. There's an incredible earthquake that takes place. I would venture to say that it lasts a month. As the earth is moving, the crust is cracking and breaking and shifting, and it's preparing the way for the Messiah to come back. Once again, all through the Old Testament talks about this. The fourth event that we have is in uh, Revelation 19, and this one is solely from the perspective of in heaven as the saints are getting ready to leave. And it's in Revelation 19:15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that is the last accounting that we have, and that's, that's at, at the corral as we're, as we're getting on the horses, riding out of heaven, riding down to earth, this was that one, so we don't see the earthquake in this one because uh, we're from a different perspective up there. But it's the fourth of the, of the four accounts that we have of the second coming. And we'll finish tonight with Revelation chapter 11, verse 14. Remember, we are at the three woes, and, and we've gotten through the two woes, which were the fifth and sixth of the vials or the bowls that are poured out with the, with the destruction in them. It says, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So, uh, uh, not next week. Uh, I'm going to be gone next week, but next time we will get into this. We will go into the third woe, and, uh, and we'll look at the second coming of Christ and all that takes place from that. Now, for the next few weeks, like I said, my kids are in the mainland. We're going to go get them. Uh, so for the next few weeks, I will not be here. We'll announce on Facebook when we're coming back, but it'll be, I think, the second week in, I mean, second Wednesday of August that uh, we'll be back and on. So that's a month from now that we'll be back on and finish uh, Revelation uh, chapter 11. Now, I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, as much as I have. I like these two characters. I like reading about them. Um, this is a lot more fun than Batman. Uh, because this is for real. This is what's going to take place. But more 
than enjoying this. I hope that you are are warned by it. I hope you are changed by it. Not so that you can get to go to heaven. That's done by the work of the cross. But so that you are a better ambassador while you're here. You know, um, if you had an ambassador that you sent over to Egypt, an American ambassador, and you send them over there and you have a, a ceremony, they get they, they become an ambassador and they're going to Egypt and now they're the American ambassador to Egypt and and the whole nation's excited. Uh, we're going to go to heaven. There's a there's singing and rejoicing when a saint comes into the kingdom, comes to get saved. And, and so all of that happens. And then your ambassador goes to Egypt. And a few years later, you check on your ambassador. And there he is over in Egypt. And he's speaking Farsi. And he's wearing a robe. And um, he is, uh, you know, selling camels or, or uh, perfume or whatever he does there, doing little tours. And um, he's got a, a nice house that he's built, and um, and you go, uh, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I'm uh, I'm living my life. And you go, you're the ambassador of the United States. Why are you wearing that? Well, because that's what uh, everybody will make fun of me if I wear a suit. Okay, but you're the ambassador to the United States. Why are you talking like that? Well, because, uh, you know, I, get, I stand out if I speak in my native tongue. Yeah, but you're the ambassador, and you're supposed to be our ambassador, and you're supposed to represent us. You're not from this country. Yeah, but I have to make a living. No, you don't. Your living's back in America. It's back home where you're from. You're here to be an ambassador. You're here, too, so that if there's other uh, Americans that you can help them and point them in the right direction and they need you to talk to them in their native tongue. And more than that, if people want to become an American, you're supposed to be able to assist them in that process and and, and show them what steps they need to go through and what they need to do and, and coordinate things on the ground here because you're a foreign citizen. You're, you're from a, a kingdom and a nation that is not from this place. We need to be better ambassadors, friends. We need to look like, act like, talk like, dress like, live our lives like, put our gold toward the things of God, the things of heaven, the things which shall be hereafter, and be a little less concerned about the here and the now. We need to be a little more concerned about the what's coming. I hope that as we look through the book of Revelation, that our minds and our eyes, that our spirits are are shifted a little bit to go, man, this is real. This is coming. These, these two witnesses, they might be here in a few years. And they're going to be calling down all this fire and all this stuff on the people of earth. And I, I hope that you go, I can do better. I can be a better ambassador than I've been. I can... I can uh, love a little better, walk a little better, uh, act a little uh, more in keeping with who I am as a Christian, and as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And um, and uh, I hope you're changed by it. And if you are, you'll be blessed, this book tells us. Okay, any questions uh, before I close? Nothing on Facebook? No questions here? Okay, I hope somebody else out there, I hope there's a young man that sees this that is so enamored with his two witnesses that 25 years from now he is teaching that if the Lord tarries, which I don't think he will. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and goodness and holiness. Again, Lord, thank you for your judgment and your righteousness that you are going to bring low all of humanity. And, and be high and lifted up. Because, Lord, we recognize now tonight that you are worthy to be high and lifted up. What a blessing it is, Father, to have a heritage in Jesus Christ and to be called and numbered as the children of God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to act like it. Help us to love you better and to walk with you closer. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you back here Sunday morning at 930. Until then, you have been with us in the book of Revelation at Crossroads Christian Fellowship. Thank you very much.